This is a 114 amp hour stationary battery from 2003 which has a capacity of about 120 amp hours and the best thing is I've got six of them and two cuties back there Sweet. Alright, so I've actually gotten a couple of requests for to do a battery slash solar video again. And since I don't want to disappoint my ravaging hordes of probably free regular viewers, <laughs> I might as well do so. And obviously these batteries are what's going on at the moment, but there's been a quite a bit of other stuff going on as well. But if we we can, might as well just start with these and I've been these were installed in a couple of uh, telecom stations out in absolutely nowhere I live in a small island and these were installed on a small island well even smaller island close to this small island with like a couple hundred people living there and they were used as uh, starting batteries for emergency diesels and they are proper deep cycle batteries like really proper UPS class batteries they were even called UPS there and I don't think these have seen an, a single cycle in their entire lives they've just been installed and been sitting at float charge for about a decade and that's good and bad because uh, they are in very good nick uh, in some ways but uh, they have grown rather unbalanced over the years and the cells have been uh, a few have like this one has pretty much every second cell has been very uh, has had a very low specific gravity where every other has had very high but uh, these two turned out quite well. I've cycled those and they came out at about 120 amp hours each which is pretty good for their rated capacity of 114 to say the least after a decade and uh, I'm currently cycling this one back here been going for about two hours and we've got 12.2 volts left it'll probably... I'm not entirely sure this one has a so that's weaker than the others. Five cells are okay, but for one here in the corner is not really up to spec when it comes to specific gravity. The great thing about these batteries though is that they are translucent like proper telecom batteries should be. So if we bring a bit of light in, you can just see so well what's going on inside your battery. You can see all the positive plates there. Mm. Doesn't show up well on camera now, does it? But you've got your positive plates there, the separators and your negative plates. And you can really just uh, inspect the batteries so well <laughs> and see if your plates are bent. They do seem to get a bit of an issue with the plates tilting to the side, as you can see in this cell there but it doesn't seem to be too much of an issue they have very thick separators so they're unlikely to short this particular battery looks really great there's no sulfate on the positive plates and the negative plates are well, they tend not to get many problems in comparison so this one's really great, this one's really great as well and they are the newest of the batch well, these are from 2003 However, these three back here are from 2001 and they are, seem to be a slightly older revision. Uh, the newer batteries have, for instance, uh, this little thing here, which is a bubble baffle or splatter baffle uh, underneath the caps which are under that blue cover. So, 
Rela, you don't get any splash whatsoever when you open the caps um, and they are bubbling a bit but you do get it on these other ones and pretty much every battery is not going every battery is going to be like these and not have that baffle but it's a really really nice touch and it allowed me to notice hey there's something different about those three and then I noticed the date code I'm not sure exactly what this is but most of them have a bit of discoloration at the end it doesn't seem to be too bad, probably just the plate being a bit bent and pressing against the case so a bit of residue has collected up here probably looks like a negative plate with some positive plate residue resting on top anyway what these batteries have some of the best examples of solfation these 2001 batteries that I've ever seen I've been balancing this one very very aggressively and this one as well because they both have one cell that's been is sitting at a very low charge it's uh, this cell in this one you can see <laughs> while I've been balancing this one's consumed a lot of water turned everything into hydrogen this one's just done nothing and uh, yeah, you can't see it as well but this is the bad cell in this one and uh, the, during the last couple of hours it started to wear off but earlier you could very 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 clearly see the sulfation in this cell when you compared it to its neighbour essentially the sulfation is This is impossible to shoot. The sulfation is this greyish stuff that you can see along the ends of the positive plates. You can see that they are greyish in colour. And if you compare it to this cell here, you can see that the positive plates are entirely brown. Very hard to make out in camera. But essentially, translucent batteries are the way to go for everything. <laughs> blob blob. So yeah, these are going to get tested, charged and everything. I think ev all of them are going to be in reasonable condition except for maybe these two. And they might... If, if I can't get them properly balanced by just uh, balance charging them using these two big power supplies uh, set to about 15.5 volts or so I've had to go with very high voltage I started low, went higher when they would not get better so if that doesn't work I'm going to let them be the subject of my little battery desulfation jig here which I made for another battery I don't think I ever actually published a video about that, but this is a little 30 kilohertz desulfation device powered by a, an AVR microprocessor and uh, this should should produce some rather significant currents flowing through the battery so I'm not too optimistic about it though because I've tried some two batteries and within about two days both of them got a shorted cell so yeah, we'll have to see that those batteries were quite bad to begin with. In other news, my solar system it has been quite significantly upgraded. And this is the battery room, complete with 12 volt LEDs in the ceiling. And this is the, cu the current battery bank, complete with a leaking uh, wall back there which I'm going to have to fix at some stage but these are all my old batteries which are just all hooked up in parallel mm -hmm. I've made videos about these maybe a couple of these 
that blue one there is a marine deep cycle. This one's a marine deep cycle, which I haven't bothered hooking up yet. This is some kind of rather strange tractor battery, which uh, I think it's packed at 140 amp hours or so. Did about 70. And it's really. This uh, area down here is just hollow. There's nothing in there. You can just stick your hands in it. And it's also got a very deformed side for some reason. No idea. Really weird caps, what you do. We should just clack off to. Very strange battery. It performs reasonably though. This one is seems to be pretty much brand new. 145 amp hours. Which I got for free from a recycling place. Very happy about that. The electrolyte's very clear if you look into the cells. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to show it on camera, but we'll give it a go. There you go, it's just super clean in there. Really, really nice looking. It's still an automotive battery, so the plates and the separators are a lot thinner than the telecom battery, so it's not really too suitable for my needs, but it's in perfect condition, so I'm using it anyway. And it's not like the rest of these batteries are suitable for my needs. The only reason I'm using them is because they're free. Up on the wall we have my entirely DIY <laughs> connection box. I built this out of old TV transmitter parts. It's an old rack case which I've turned on its top, made a couple of cutouts in, I mounted the old panel meters from that transmitter in. I made a custom scale for this one. And as you can see, we have pretty low voltage in the bank right now. It's about 12.2 volts. That's because I accidentally left it running with about a 300 watt load for 20 hours. And it's starting to get dark outside, so I'm not getting a whole lot out of those panels. Indeed, it's midday and we're getting 12 watts. Hmm. Yeah, that's Finland for you. Anyway, inside here we've got breakers. This is the main battery breaker, which, if I flick it, yeah, we've got some capacitance. Okay, I've got no idea what's going on there. <laughs> um, what? Oh yeah, that the solar regulator is connected after that probably, so it freaked out and made the voltage go up there. Good thing I've got my meter. I switch the... Uh, let's see, this is the photovoltaic panels input, so if I switch those, the blue LED there goes off and it thinks it's night time. This is the breaker for the lights and auxiliary stuff. And this is the breaker for the uh, auxiliary solar box there. Now, I think this is a 20 amp breaker, this is a 16 amp breaker, and this is a 56 amp breaker. And the reason that one's so big is because I've got uh, my Anderson connection for external charging there. It needs to be able to handle quite a lot of current. And that's also why we've got these really thick cables going in there. Uh, this breaker is a 125 to 160 amp, 600 volt AC or DC. You can see there, haha, <laughs> fancy. Breaker out of the analog TV transmitter, and I'm happy about that because th those things do not come cheap. These are literally two thousand dollar breakers, and I've got another one here for spares. So definitely not complaining about that. They're also free face, so I can could in theory run three different strings of batteries on them if I wanted to. Anyway. 
The output of this breaker actually goes uh, through these uh, repurposed ground wires, 70 square millimeters, also from the analog TV transmitter, into this thing which I have intended to make a video about. This is a 1500 VA APC Smart UPS uh, SUA 1500i is the model number, which I've modified to run off of 12 volts. And it does indeed work. There you go. It's a bit dodgy, it need, pretty much needs to have a huge cap connected back there, since the ripple ripple current is absolutely huge on this thing when it's under load. But uh, even though it's consuming twice the current as it does on a 24 volt system, it is capable of running continuously on above 102% load without exploding. So I'm very happy about that. Down there you can see the input cables and the capacitor connection which is just the original Anderson connection for the external battery bank. This is the case off of a uh, back UPS XL750 with uh, the modified guts of a back UPS 1500 installed. I've doubled the Oh, we can have a look inside actually to see some of the magic behind this. You need to have at least two UPSs as donors if you want to make one of these. Ah. Let's see, do you see? Ah. Jesus. We might be able to sneak a peek in there. And I've replaced the battery compartment with a second transformer. So, this unit actually has two transformers and the way it works is the primaries are wired in parallel and the secondaries are wired in series. You can just see some air guides in there because it was running very hot even with the dual fans. So, Rather than modifying one of these, what I've done is I've uh, doubled the number of uh, switching transistors and doubled the number of transformers. And that's pretty much it. Uh, I've had to change a couple of uh, surface mount resistors in it in order to make it start up on a voltage as low as 12 volts. But aside from that, uh, this unit has not been modified. Uh, all things considered, the modifications are minor, given that uh, you have two units to uh, take parts from. There we go. I wrote out some rough specifications there. The big problem about this thing is that its idle current idle consumption is about 25 watts so I really can't have it running 24-7 it just uses too much uh, power, I mean that's almost 2 amps at idle so my panels can't keep up unless it's right in the smack middle of summer which, well in Finland it's never summer moving on uh, this mess down here is my Im just uh, very quickly slapped together monitoring system. Uh, it's just a few, not, not only two of these are used, I believe. No, three. We've got uh, one, well, essentially it's running one ground and. No, oh, is it running one ground or two grounds? It's running four cables, which are both connected in parallel to the battery bank. So we've got 2 times 12 volts running through this whole VGA cable that's just lying on the floor and going through the wall up there. So you can see my LED driver by the way, one of those cheapies from Deluxe Stream, as well as uh, the auxiliary, auxiliary uh, mains voltage coming in for battery charging and so forth and just a 12 volt light switch there with 
one unused connection. Also, lots of cooking soda scattered everywhere. In case a battery explodes or something goes horribly wrong, I want to be able to just open the door and grab one of these and throw it onto the acid because I'd, I'd rather not uh, risk anything. These are crappy old batteries, anything could happen. So, safety first, kind of, when you can be bothered. <laughs> now, that's more or less it for the battery room. That cable there, the white one, is the photovoltaic input. It's a 2 times 6 square millimeter cable run to the panels in the yard. Anyway, back to the VDA cable, it's really sloppily running just <laughs> along the ceiling, hanging from some old hanger thingies. And it ends up on this pillar here. And uh, yeah, I used to have a connector, but now it's just cables tucked into it which go to one of these crappy DT830 multimeters and this just monitors my battery bank voltage. Now I used to have a another voltage meter here, uh, one of these same ones that's uh, installed in this one, looks like that. These can just run off of the same voltage source as they're measuring that's why I had uh, two uh, cable, two feeds running here, so I could have one feed which powered the meter and another one which gave a voltage reading. Since these VDA cables are quite uh, thin, even uh, the little 10 milliamp draw from the meter would make a slight voltage drop. But this multimeter can't do that, so I've just got down here. A battery that I brought home which got a shorted cell. I think I used this with the desulfate of the testing. And this is probably a 60-ish amp hour battery by now, which should power this meter for a number of years. <laughs> or until I mean this meter uses about one milliamp when it's just sitting like this. So I'm quite proud of it proud of that because it's a pretty good way to just use a ruined battery because you can't use a battery with a shorted cell for anything but hey ten and a half volts that's pretty good for a 9 volt battery powered meter hmm now that will probably be most of what's going on right now been japping on for 20 minutes Voltage dropped down to 12.188 and my coffee's gone cold. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Cheerio. Oh, and as for my panels, I'm not sure I ever made a video about it, but I now run to 235 watt TN Ways, which I bought off of eBay for about $1 per watt. And these seem to be doing a good job. They were cheap, they're not the most efficient, but uh, yeah, I'm mostly just faffing about with this. Still live in Finland, this is our weather. It's not very bright, giving me 13 watts most of the year. <laughs> they aren't optimally aimed either. Uh, my charge controllers can't really handle the power they put out, so if there's really sunny, it'll just go into overload alarm mode and shut off and not charge my batteries, which is a bit of an issue. But yeah, there's really no such thing as proper aiming of these in the winter time around here. We never get any sun. We mostly just keep the battery bank charged and get, get put to use in summer. Cheerio.